and so you have um, right. So that's uh, that's roughly what this picture is. So it's a more generic. Uh, it's a more generic wormhole. So this is. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about wormholes today later, but uh, that's um, that's what the picture was. Um, Can I ask also a basic question? Yes. So if we compute this real back and I mean say any part. Yes. Then I want to study correct not one over n, but one over. N. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this this could be was part of what I was trying to say today. So let me just say it right now. So the entropy uh, we said was area area over g newton, and uh, so this is uh, one over g newton. And in, in n equal to four super Yamets, it would be one over some factor of one over n squared, right? Um, but in n equal to four, we are used to the fact that we have corrections which uh, go like powers one over square root of lambda, right, to various powers and some some number c n, right? So how do we compute these numbers? I have it flipped. This one? Oh, yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Uh, n squared. So this is a further n squared, and then we have uh, this power series expansion in lambda. Now, notice that this, from the point of view of the bulk, so this n, so n is uh, 1 over the coupling, 1 over g string. So all of this is classical in the bulk, should be viewed as classical uh, string theory in the bulk. OK? And um, the idea is that uh, this should come from higher order corrections in the gravitational action. So we have an action which uh, contains, for example, uh, square root of gr. Uh, if we take the particular case of 10-dimensional uh, super ML, so we'll, uh, in ADS we have a, an r to the fourth correction, is the first uh, curvature correction that we have. Um, so the idea is that uh, this first term in the action uh, will produce uh, an area term, and this term will produce some correction. And you have to work uh, a little bit to see what the correction is. So let me first discuss this for the case of black holes. So for the case of black holes, it's a little simpler, because um, uh, the solution has a U1 symmetry, and you can uh, give a more explicit formula. Well, the other, the other formula has also wor be been worked out, but it's a little harder to remember. <coughs> So um, also for black hole thermodynamics, we'll have the same type of corrections. Right? Um, and the, the formula, the general formula for a general Lagrangian was uh, derived by Wald. Um, and um, the idea is that the, um, the entropy is given by So in the case of uh, black holes with human symmetry, so the entropy is given by taking the derivative of uh, the Lagrangian. So, so I'm just giving you the, the final formula just to see what flavor it has. I'm not deriving the formula, of course. But, so you take the derivative with respect to the curvature, r mu nu sigma delta, right? And then you contract with the normal binormal to the horizon, so mu nu epsilon sigma delta. So this is uh, essentially an epsilon tensor in the R and Euclidean time direction. So you have the, the black hole will contain uh, a circle direction. Let's label it by uh, coordinate tau. This is Euclidean time. And then there is a point where the circle shrinks to zero. So let's call the radial coordinate R, right? So this is just an epsilon tensor of the E and R tau direction. And then you integrate this over the horizon, right? So that's uh, the formula. And for the case of um, for this case, this derivative just gives you a constant. Um, and well, this derivative contracted with this gives you a constant, and then you get the area. right? So that uh, represents the area formula. In particular, the Lagrangian is a classical Lagrangian that contains uh, 1 over g squared in front times a bunch of things, right? times some action, so that all the terms will be of order 1 over g squared. And um, um, OK. And so you can uh, well the derive this uh, by using, um, essentially, trying to derive a formula where first consider the first law of, of, um, of thermodynamics, and so wrote, uh, draw the energy at infinity, and then consider arbitrary variations of the energy and found what quantity obeys the uh, 
the first law and then in that way you key derive them. Um, okay, so that's, uh, that's, those are those corrections. Um, a remark I could make right now is that um, if we view uh, gravity as an effective field theory, um, there might be other competing corrections. So um, let's say we are in four dimensions. Uh, so then uh, we, we, we have the usual term m Planck squared or one over one over g Newton. Yeah, let, let me put it in terms of m Planck. m Planck squared times r, and then we you can have here terms of the form r squared, right? And these terms have a dimensionless coefficient in front, right? So the correction, so if, if you uh, follow an, if you think of gravity as an effective field theory where the cutoff is in Planck, right? Then this term uh, will have a coefficient of order one and its contribution to the black hole entropy will also be of order one. But that contribution is also comparable with the quantum contribution, so the loop correction, the just one loop correction of the field. So the, the same contribution as the entanglement entropy correction we discussed before. So it would be incorrect to just consider only this correction and not consider the entanglement entropy correction, unless for some reason this one was enhanced a little bit. So um, in some cases it, it, it uh, might be enhanced by logarithmic factors and so on. So but now in, in string theory we um, we often get these corrections uh, with, um, so for example in string theory we can have 1 over g string squared here um, and, and the prefactor here is a function of g string but in particular it contains a term that um, um, contains a term that has the same order as the, uh, the Einstein gravity term so uh, um, and so the, here the wall uh, argument uh, certainly would apply but yeah so if you are now trying to apply the the argument for the case where um, so this con so this is a whole series as a fun this is another term which is of this form right so if now we have uh, this term of this order then you need to worry about at this order you would need to worry about the the one loop correction also okay um, Okay, so that's uh, that story. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You ha you have to be careful on how to how you do it. Uh, but yes. So even on what the meaning of this uh, correction really is. Uh, yeah, part. Yeah, that's right. So you you need to understand this properly. So my, my remark is that you need you can forget about those terms only for these classical terms. But once you get to the loop loop order terms, you have to worry about such things. Okay, you have to justify it a little more. Um, okay, very good. Um, so the conclusion is not that you just consider the full effective action with respect to alpha prime and put this thing that then would follow the usual. Thing. That's right. That's right. That's uh, that's right. That would be too fast, and it would be an incorrect answer. Um, um, okay. Yes. Uh, yeah. Good. So um, no. So the world formula it was derived uh, with the assumption of a local Lagrangian. Yeah, that was another point I was. Uh, forgetting to say so one there is a question so or exercise so let's see exercise uh, derive uh, formula for en for the entropy in string theory right so we we don't we don't know what the formula is um, we, we <laughs> at least I don't know maybe one of you would but maybe I shouldn't have told you that. It's, it's an exercise, and then <laughs> when someone will figure th this out. But um, so, in principle, the the partition function of string theory. So there is the Euclidean thermodynamics method, which consists in computing the uh, the classical action in string theory. The analog of this classical action is the partition function of the world sheet on on S two, right? Not the particular. So that's in principle what you are computing, and then you need to take 
beta dd beta of this quantity. So you need to take the derivative with respect to the temperature, and from there get the entropy. And in classical gravity, that gives you this local formula in terms of the area of the horizon. And here, you would expect that it will give you something that involves the wall sheet, so some current on the wall sheet, and perhaps some simple wall sheet computation. This is the best you could hope for, I think. Um, you're not going to get the area, or the area plus curvature. So you're going to get something that makes sense in the conformal field theory that describes uh, the black hole background. Um, um, yeah. Um, and then once you have this formula, uh, yeah, then you can, then you find out what the conformal field theory is, let's say for ADS5 times S5, with a black, black hole, well, not ADS5 times S5, but for the black brain, and then you go from weak to strong coupling, and calculate the uh, free energy, at least in order in N4 values of the coupling. Um, should I explain that remark a little more? Well, anyway, so that's an application of the exercise. You can concentrate on this exercise. <laughs> um, well, you laugh, but so this will be done. I mean, this will be done not some few years, but soon, maybe by one of you. Um, um, OK, so I'll, I'd like now, now to explain a little more. I mean, it's something probably some of you probably are familiar with but I'm trying to explain so we, we find that we found that the entanglement entropy for the entanglement entropy had a diversions in field theory so in quantum field theory it had a diversions which was the area over uh, epsilon to the d minus 2 right and uh, in gravity we had that it was uh, the area divided by L Planck to the d minus 2 right so this suggests that gravity is somehow regular, regularized in this, uh, this diversions, and it's giving us something finite, right? So that uh, it's even suggesting a picture for where the entropy of the black hole is, which is in the fields outside the black hole horizon. And then if you, if you went all the way to the horizon, you put the cutoff exactly equal to, to zero, then you would get infinity. But if you put it somehow equal to M Planck, you might get uh, this entropy. This is what I just said is a qualitative hand-waving argument. Uh, the correct uh, statement to make, so the conservative statement to make, is to say that this is always should be viewed as a correction, and you should never take the cutoff smaller than n Planck. The cutoff should always be, be taken bigger than n Planck in the formalism of effective field theory. As, uh, so, uh, so if you take that conservative point of view, this is always smaller than this, and you absorb these diversions in the. Um, I mean, you, you could imagine that you would absorb these diversions from a counter term in the in the action, and uh, G Newton also gets renormalized at one loop. So this is the classical answer. Then you do the one loop computation, you will get um, a um, renormalization. You, you, get a, you will need to introduce a counter term proportional to Riemann curvature, and the coefficient should be equal to this one in such a way that uh, you get uh, cancellation. But, yes. 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 The, this, the, the thing is that this calculation is what. Well, so the entropy is supposed to be this plus. Uh, yeah. Okay. So let's uh, let's be a little more explicit. I, I will discuss this a little more in detail in later. What I would like to. Um, well, what I would like to do first is. Um, so maybe you can ask me your question in five minutes. So what I'd like to understand first is how gravity regulates this. What is different between the gravity computation? of entanglement and the field theory computation of entanglement. Um, of course, uh, so at some the, the, the reason we got something finite in gravity is because we calculated the Euclidean action. So for example, from the Euclidean formalism, it's very clear. So we calculate the Euclidean action at arbitrary temperatures, and then we take some derivative. We are going to get something finite. And we're going to get something finite of order 1 over g Newton because the Euclidean action was had a 1 over g Newton in front. So there is no. No mystery from that point of view. Um, however, I'd like to we'd like to to see it uh, slightly more explicitly to see where the difference between the two computations is. And for that, we'll let's imagine we're trying to compute the entanglement entropy in flat space, right? So we have flat space and we have uh, half of space. So the same uh, picture we were discussing before um, with, when we're talking about Rinder. 
And when we're talking about Rindler, so we uh, can introduce, um, so to calculate the entropy, we need to, uh, so we could think about Euclidean evolution here, and we need to change the temperature a little bit, right? And for these cases with U1 symmetry, we can imagine changing the temperature by such a small amount. It would amount to introducing a defect angle there. So in field theory, what we do is we started with the metric d s squared equal to dr squared plus um, dt squared r squared n squared, right? So that's just the metric of uh, Rinder space where t, let's say we take t to have period 2 pi always for any n and then we vary n a little bit. So the proper size of this circle is changing and by taking the derivative with respect to n we'll get the, so we calculate the partition function uh, log, remember, we calculated the partition function log of Cn on a space with a small conical with some uh, some small defect angle. Uh, so this is the picture for n different than 1. Uh, and then we take the derivative of this and take the limit when n goes to 1. Now, so that's the field theory computation. So this would be the field theory computation amounts to doing the partition function uh, of the field theory on this space. Okay, so this is this was field theory. Okay, um, is that clear? So that's what we discussed before. Is it clear to everyone? Yeah. So now let's contrast that with the computation we would do in uh, in gravity. So in gravity, the metric is dynamical, so we can't uh, really fix. We cannot say that we are going to compute gravity on a space which looks like this. Right? But what we can say is we can fix the boundary conditions. So we can say that uh, we have uh, we have this metric, uh, the r squared plus r squared. Um, so this is the full metric. Um, so this was the original metric. And we can say we go up to some circle of size rc, so some cutoff. This would be some infrared cutoff in the gravity picture. And we fix the metric on that, that line, so on this surface. Um, so we say that the metric on this surface is going to be rc squared times dt squared. So that was the original one. And then we fill it in in the interior so that it's non-singular. So that gives, would give us this metric. That's the, back the original problem. But something we can do is we can change the uh, size of this circle, the physical size a little bit. And then we, when we fill it in, uh, we, can, we are supposed to fill it in in a way that uh, is non-singular. And we can fill it in in a non-singular way um, if um, we just multiply the original metric by. So if we now consider this new metric, uh, then we fill it in in a non-singular way. So in contrast with the, so while in field theory we got this space with a conical defect angle, in gravity we just get the circle, okay? We just get again a circle, a smooth circle. Um, and um, so that's the difference between the two cases, so in the Euclidean uh, situation. And of course uh, from here we can uh, calculate the, um, the partition function in gravity, so this is really a piece of the Hawk, usual Gibbons Hawking computation. Um, so we just say we have 1 over 16 pi g newton um, integral of square root of g r minus 2 extrinsic curvature. So this is the integral over the disk. Uh, and this is the integral over the line times rest. So the space could have some other dimensions orthogonal to this times rest. So the rest uh, will be the area, of just the area of the transfer space. Let me put it here, the area. And now consider just the line and the disk. The extrinsic curvature term comes from uh, saying that, well, we would like to have an action defined. Uh, so what this problem with the boundary condition, we would like to have an action which is uh, well defined so that the equations of motion are the us usual Einstein equations. So, um, and introducing the extrinsic curvature makes sure that when you calculate uh, a small variation of this action and you integrate by parts to derive Einstein's equations, you don't have any extra extraneous boundary terms. Okay? Um, so this is standard, it was uh, also figures in the gibbons hawking calculation. Um, very good, so you have this. And now we just need to evaluate this for a disk. Um, and 
for a disk, uh, this is just a topological invariant. Um, and um, so, well, you can. So this R, R would be um, R would be zero, right, for a flat disk, and k is like one over the size of the disk, right? And so we multiply by the size, we get the number. So it's clear that it would be a number. Um, and well, this is a number which is uh, which is four pi. Okay. Um, if you you can compute it. Or once you realize it's topological invariant, you can take two disks and you get the sphere and uh, you calculate just this for the sphere. And but anyway, so so that gives a factor of four pi and that reproduces, of course, the uh, well. So we got area over four g newton for any n, and then we take uh, the formula for the entropy. Recall was uh, one minus n the n of log of c n. But of course, uh, this doesn't depend on n, so we just simply got the uh, area over 4g newton. Okay, so that's uh, the answer in gravity, um, and this is the usual derivation. I mean, not making a new derivation. This is the usual derivation, but uh, applied just uh, for for this uh, flat space region and for trying to compute the gravitational um, entanglement entropy of a half half a space. Um, Now, um, in some sense, this, in, from the Euclidean point of view, this is telling us why that we don't have a diversion. So we got a diversion in the field theory case because we're doing a computation in a singular space. So if we're doing the field theory computation in a smooth space, we'd get something finite. But we did a computation in a singular space, and that's why we got something infinite. But here, uh, we are doing the computation always on a smooth space. So gravity always uh, chooses a solution that is smooth. Um, now, of course, um, this um, this tells us how it works in the Euclidean case, but it doesn't directly tell us how it works in the Lorentzian picture case. So, in the Lorentzian space, we have the picture in the field theory that we have the um, we have a Rindler horizon. So now we go to Lorentzian signature. We have a Rindler horizon. We have uh, the right hand side of the Rindler horizon. And we have this gas of particles here at very high temperature as we approach the horizon. And um, OK, so that's uh, infinite. How is gravity really regularizing this infinity? Right? Can we say it in a more Lorentzian picture? Um, and in Lorentzian picture, what is happening is the following. So if we have Rinder space, um, so we, we notice that in Rinder space, we, we had that the temperature was equal to the acceleration over 2 pi. The acceleration is just the geometric property of, uh, of it's just the property of the metric, right? So once uh, we're given the metric, uh, we know what the acceleration is. And the temperature, well, it tells us about the state in the, of the quantum fields uh, here in Rindler. And in Rindler, we could imagine taking the temperature different, a temperature different from the acceleration. Of course, that would produce a singularity on this surface, but we could imagine taking it different. And that's what we do when we calculate the entropy. So we take the temperature slightly different than the acceleration. But in gravity, what is happening is that we, we start with uh, the, something like Rindler. We try to uh, change the temperature away from the acceleration. And the <coughs> geometry moves, or the, the horizon moves, uh, in such a way that uh, the temperature becomes equal to the acceleration again. Right? So that's the statement that the geometry smooth at the origin. Right? So, um, so in some sense, uh, and this is, this you can view it as a slightly more Lorentzian version of the mechanism. Um, and um, so something we can say is that uh, people in the past said that uh, nature abhors a vacuum. So nature hates a vacuum. That's why things rush into fill the vacuum. Uh, but we could say now gravity uh, really pref allows only the vacuum. So gravity really only likes the vacuum. We could try to take the fields away from it in a singular way and it doesn't allow that. Now one would like to have, probably one would have to ha like a more, uh, uh, more explicit uh, formulation of where the, um, this, the black hole entropy is coming from. And we definitely have from string theory some very concrete descriptions of black hole entropy, but they are not local in the sense that they don't come from integrating over. In particular, the descriptions we have of this in string theory 
do not come from a regularized version of this integral that we would do in field theory. It's a much more indirect way of calculating the entropy. And we, we could discuss that in, in an extra lecture, perhaps. Um, how to get black hole entropy from string theory. But uh, all the derivations come from, well, looking at the system from far away, from a boundary, perhaps, and finding a description for the whole space-time and so on. But we don't have a local uh, description of where the entropy comes from. And if we had it, then we probably would be in better shape to answer other questions of uh, black holes, uh, information paradox, and so on. If we had a more local description. So um, maybe there isn't, and maybe black hole entropy always has to be described in a non-local way. So that's uh, one possibility. Um, OK, higher derivative corrections I already discussed. So let's see. Um, and um, that's the next topic. Um, oh, quantum corrections. OK, so let's discuss a bit quantum corrections. We discussed them a little bit. Let's discuss them a little more. Uh, so we're now going to try to discuss quantum corrections to black hole entropy. So first, uh, the simplest way. Yes. But the correction to real time my question was about the correction to real time dynamics. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, I forgot. Yes. So so the correction to root so in Ruta Kayanagi is equivalent to um ends up being equivalent to considering um this kind of Euclidean computation for a situation that uh, is not U one symmetric. So there is some uh some circle that is it's basically very similar to before. But the circle doesn't have the UN symmetry. Um, and in that case, uh, you can use this replica trick that we discussed before. Uh, and, and you can do Euclidean, sort of some, a generalization of Euclidean thermodynamics, uh, but now using this replica trick. So you. Um, well, let me just first give you one sentence. The answer is that it is not the same formula, and it's a formula that uh, includes um, extrinsic curvatures. So extrinsic curvatures of the surface, and it's slightly more complicated. Um, yes, in the case with U1 symmetry, it reduces to this one. Yeah. Um, so the extrinsic curvatures of this surface uh, are tensors that have indices in the two orthogonal directions, right? And if you have a U1 symmetry, then they have to vanish. Um, OK, so good. So now let's uh, discuss quantum corrections. Yes? I don't know if it's a good time to bring up the question. Yes. How does this resolution relate to the structure for the argument you gave? Um, it's, 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 it's totally it's unrelated. We, we'll now discuss uh, your question. Yes. yes. So what's the main reason we got the divergence is Yes. Yes. Um, well, you c you could say that uh, this is somehow a little unphysical, having to do with the uh, the singularity, and we should not consider these uh, divergent uh, contributions to the entropy, and we should only focus on the finite parts. So you could certainly say that. Mm -hmm. So I won't complain if you say that. Um, 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 so, but I, I, yeah, it's it's interesting that if you naively add this entropy, you get something that has the same structure. So, people for a long time thought that we would get the black hole entropy in this way, and this people said this before there were any results of black hole entropy in string theory. And um, once we understood how well, in then one can compute black hole entropy in string theory using BPS black holes or ADS-CFT, and the computation doesn't look like this. It's a completely different computation. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
Well, here, I mean, we would have matter fields which are con so we had flat space, so we have some constant matter fields. They don't, they, they don't, but the yes, yes. I, I'll, I'll try to maybe ask me the question in, in five minutes. So uh, <laughs> maybe I confused you a little bit. So I discussed here two different computations. One is field theory computation, and the other one is gravity. And I tried to point out what the difference was between the two. One, why one was finite and why the other one was infinite. Okay, that's. I'm not saying one is equal to the other. I then vaguely said that maybe there is some relation, but I didn't offer any concrete relation. Uh, so now I'll try to relate them in the in a logical way, but uh, still not answering the vague. So we are going to consider quantum corrections to black hole thermodynamics. So Euclidean black hole thermodynamics is based on considering the metric of the Euclidean black hole for arbitrary beta, right? And then we calculate the log of the partition function of full gravity theory on this geometry, which can be expanded. It will have a classical action. So this is the classical action, which is a function of beta. Uh, so this comes from integrating 1 over, well, something of the form G Newton, R curvature, and so on. And then we have a one-loop correction. Uh, that comes from the one loop determinants of all the quadratic fluctuations of all fields on this geometry, uh, including the graviton and uh, scalar fields or whatever other fields we have. So let me write this as log of determinants, uh, roughly speaking. Of course, if it's a scalar field, there are factors of a half and so on. Um, so, so this. Uh, this is uh, the full computation. And of course, this uh, log of determinants are uh, infinite. And you need to regularize them. So by this term, I also include the subtraction of any uh, counter terms that we can have. Right? So we'll have integrals of counter terms. So there will be 1 minus epsilon to the 4 square root of g plus some terms 1 over epsilon squared r, and so on. Right? So this regularize with, uh, with um, cut of epsilon. And then we have this whole thing. So this whole thing is supposed to be finite, right? right? Finite for any beta. OK. Is, is this clear? Um, I mean, these powers of epsilon are the ones for four dimensions, of course. In other dimensions, we might have more, uh, more counter terms. Um, and then you can uh, calculate uh, the entropy. So the entropy is, uh, well, this formula we have seen many times of uh, the log of C of eta. And well, you'll get a classical piece, which uh, will come from the classical action, uh, which uh, if you take the, the action is just this, we'll get the area divided by 4G Newton. Um, and then we'll get something that comes from taking the derivative of this. So whatever we get from taking the derivative of this is going to be finite, right? This was finite for any beta. We take the derivative, we still get something <coughs> finite. Okay. Now, we can decompose that finite thing that we get into a sum of uh, pieces. Okay. So we can take uh, first the derivative of beta d beta of this quantity, and then of this quantity. Right? And what that, um, so that will give us uh, a bunch of, uh, a sum of the various, so we're going to now uh, take these derivatives by, by parts of the various terms, and we'll get the sum of terms that will be separately infinite, well, separately divergent. So we'll get one piece that will be the entanglement entropy outside um, from taking part of, the, from partly from this, well, essentially only from this. Um, then we'll get a term um, that I'm going to write as minus, to a term from here, um, area over epsilon squared. Right. So this term would not contribute nothing, and this term. So these terms have the same form as the original classical action. So when we calculate um, the action for these terms, we'll get the same form as the original one. So we'll get uh, such terms, um, and then uh, we'll get other terms, which uh, are like something like delta area of four G Newton plus um, um, delta. Let me call it as wall like. Um, expectation value. So I'll discuss these terms in, in a second. Um, so first, uh, let me just say something simple. So 
this uh, term had some divergences. Uh, and then uh, they will be canceled by the divergences we got from here. So the divergences cancel. Then there are these other finite terms, and I'll discuss them uh, now one by one. Um, So the main thing to say is that uh, here the main qualitatively new term is this one, because this is going to be a non-local expression, comes from some kind of determinant and integrated over the, is integrated over the fields outside the black hole horizon. These two other terms will be evaluated on the black hole horizon, can be with a small correction to the, something similar to what we had before. Um, OK, so when we calculate uh, 1 minus beta dd beta of log of uh, of the one loop determinant piece of log of uh, that, right? So this is the the one loop determinant. Well, we could put C one loop. Um, this derivative really contains two parts. One is uh, just that we are changing the period of the time direction, and the other one is that we are changing the met the metric. So the met the black hole metric changes because it has to change in order to for the circle to contract in a smooth way at the origin. So um, let me be. Well, was this is understood, or should I explain it more? Yeah. Yes. No, this, this is the this is the counter term you need. So the, the, first of all, the counter terms are only due because to, to the fact that we're doing a one loop correction, right? So we had the classical action, then we have the one loop correction. No, no, the, the classical action, the, the action we started with, so okay, so we start with some classical action, we, we keep this uh, finite. This will contain some divergences, and we shall simply, when epsilon goes to zero, we subtract those divergences. Um, is that? Yes, there is. Yes, yes, there are such ambiguities. Um, no, well, these are, these, are, these are uninteresting ambiguities because it, the whole thing is, so you, you do it whatever way you want, and these finite ambiguities correspond to finite shift in G Newton. Since in the very beginning you didn't know what G Newton was, uh, so you could just shift uh, the original value of G Newton. Um, if you started from some theory where you know for some very specific reason what G Newton was, then maybe it makes more sense to consider, um, to understand those finite shifts. But in general, uh, from the point of view of an effective field theory and so on, it doesn't matter. So, so the more, most practical thing is to just say you subtract everything, and, uh, and, um, and that's it. Um, OK, so uh, what was I saying? Yeah. Um, right, so we'll. Um, We'll have some. We'll have the the change in the period of the the coordinate uh, of the coordinate, and that if we only change that, that would correspond to doing the partition function on the black hole metric, where we introduce a conical singularity. So we took the original black hole metric and we changed the period of the time direction. So we do only that. We get a, a singularity of the black hole for non-zero bet for a different beta. And when we take the derivative, we get the entanglement entropy. That's the standard calculation, the same calculation we're doing in the field theory, right? Computing the partition function in a space with a cone. Right? So this piece is the S entanglement. And then there is the explicit uh, dependence of the metric of the black hole. And this has the form, the integral of t mu nu, uh, beta d d beta of uh, g mu nu, OK? So, this uh, this is the quantum expectation value of the stress tensor uh, in the due to the one loop corrections. So not let's say for simplicity, let's fix the classical t mu nu to zero, and uh, consider fluctuations around let's say a Schwarzschild black hole where nothing has an expectation value. Then uh, due to quantum mechanics, it might happen that uh, you get the quantum expectation value for the fields, right? For example, you know, with the Casimir effect, you do get uh, such an expectation value. And uh, since the black hole, let's say, very far away looks like a cylinder, you certainly expect something like this. Uh, so you, you expect a term of this form. 
And this is the explicit dependence of the metric on the temperature. So if you had a Schwarzschild black hole, this would come from changing the mass of the Schwarzschild black hole, that we need to change the mass when we change the temperature. Okay. Um, so that's, um, that's what we get from here. And um, this term, uh, so this, this whole expression, I want to uh, explain in detail, but uh, can be understood as, um, as what I wrote over there, delta area. Turns out that it's equal to delta area over 4G Newton. So you need to use the Einstein equations of the bracket and so on. Now, delta area, what it means is the following. So we had the original Schwarzschild black hole, wh which, had, which was a solution with zero stress tensor. But now we have this quantum mechanical stress tensor, ge quantum mechanical generated stress tensor, and we'll need to change the black hole solution. And the new black hole solution, the area for this particular temperature will be different. So that's the delta area. Of course, the change in the area is of order g newton. So this is of order one. Okay. So this term is uh, also of order one in the same. That's of order one in the one over in the g newton expansion. So they are all independent of g newton. And uh, the last term is something you can uh, forget about in the first approximation. But let me give you an example where such a term arises. Is if you had a term in the action which had uh, a coupling of this form, um, then uh, let's say phi is zero in the original background. So this term is not contributing to the entropy in the original background. But you could have, um, however, if we formally calculate the wall entropy formula through the, form, through the formulas we were discussing there, there will be an additional term proportional to phi squared. And then that term corresponds to take the quantum expectation value of phi squared, which might be non-zero, could have even a finite piece. There will be a diversion piece, and there could be also a finite piece. The diversion piece also should cancel for uh, generic reasons. Um, OK, so those are the various terms. Uh, this, uh, this last, uh, so these last few terms are not too important. This one uh, is a little more interesting because it's a qualitatively new contribution. Um, and well, that's uh, that's the story. OK, so people had questions. Now, now that's the time. If I didn't answer them, uh, it's the time to ask them again. Did I answer them? Or, yeah. You also, I think, had a question. Or, who else? Pedro, I think. No. Ah, OK. Mm -hmm. OK, good. Um, I'm going to skip this. Oh, let's see. Um, so now we'll discuss quantum corrections to the Ruta Kainagi formula. Um, well, let me let me just for make a simple. Yeah. Le yeah. Do you also have a way of understanding the kind of correction? Yeah. So. Um, so again, in, in string theory, you would have to compute the one-loop diagram. So the, the original, the classical one would be just the sphere diagram in string theory. And the next correction is just the uh, one-loop diagram. Um, and um, yeah, in principle, you could, you could compute this uh, one-loop uh, corrections. Um, for the case of the BTC black hole, we did compute these one-loop corrections in a paper with, um, with uh, Johnson and, um, and Hiroshi Oguri. Um, but yeah, so you you can compute them. Um, okay, so um, right. So now quantum corrections to Rune Takayanagi. Um, um, so, oh, before I go to the quantum correction, so there is one little thing I wanted to mention here. So. If you, if you really want to compute the quantum correction to the black hole entropy, you really want to get the number. You want to get whether it's pi or 3 or whatever. It is uh, simpler to do, it, to do it in the Euclidean method, typically. You get something finite directly. You don't have to worry, uh, worry about these different pieces. The reason I discuss this is just because this piece, is have, uh, this piece has, an interesting, has this interesting interpretation, and we used it before also. Right? So that's why I was discussing it. Um, Ah, another thing I should discuss is that uh, I should mention here is that sometimes uh, the uh, the one these one loop corrections are sometimes have some logarithms have some large logarithms. This is especially the case when there is a logarithmic divergence here. 
Um, and uh, so those logarithms are typically easier to compute than, uh, than the full determinant, the full number, because and um, Sen, for example, computed those and matched them between microscopic entropy computations and ma macroscopic uh, computations of this kind. Um, okay, so now back to quantum corrections to Ruta Kainagi. And before saying what it is, let's start with a simple paradox. So imagine that we have a, a spatial direction, right? And we consider two intervals that are separated by a very long distance. Then in this case, the entanglement entropy of A is given by this, the entanglement entropy of B is given by this, and the entanglement entropy of A and B is given by some surface which uh, starts and ends on these uh, two boundaries. In principle, it's uh, two lines that go between here and here, for example. But you can reconnect them and then make them equal to the two lines that we had in the beginning. And, um, and so the entanglement entropy of a, SA, so SA union P is equal to SA plus SB. And if you remember the formula for mutual information, which was SA plus SB minus SA union B, this implies that the mutual information between A and B is actually zero. Okay. So this is only true. So this is true with the root Akainai formula, which is proportional to the length of this formula of this of, of this of this geodesics in this case. Um, but recall that there was a bound saying that this uh, mutual information is less or equal than any connected correlator that we can have between A and B, right? A formula roughly of this form, right? So how can this be correct? So the important point here is that um, the correlators that are non-zero, so are correlators of, let's say, some gravity, gravity modes, uh, which are of order one. They are not of order one over G Newton. Okay. So really, to check this, we need to understand what these entropies are to order one over G Newton. <coughs> now, if you follow the derivation, um, so one can derive the Ruta-Ganagi formula from the rules of ADS-CFT. And if you follow that derivation and you uh, to one loop, so you get something very similar to what we were discussing here. And what you end up with is that the entanglement entropy of region A is again the area, so that's the classical piece, uh, plus the entanglement entropy of um, the entanglement entropy in the case of black holes was entanglement entropy outside. In the case of uh, this Rutakanai discussion, is the entanglement entropy of these regions, right? So the region that is, um, so if we have an interval, some region A, we have the Rutakanai surface, so we, the region that is between the interval and the surface, right? Which in some sense is the region exterior. So if you view the surface as the horizon, analogous to the horizon of the black hole, so it's the surface outside the horizon. Right? So let me call that uh, A bulk. So it, well, it's the, the bulk region connected to A. So it's the entanglement entropy in the bulk of this. So we consider the fields in the bulk. So now we have quantum fields in the bulk. And there is some entanglement of these quantum fields between this region and uh, the rest. OK. And so now, if, uh, so now uh, there is a non-trivial. So in this case, um, when we consider S uh, A union B, it's not just the sum of these two entropies, but it's actually a bit bigger because there could be entanglement between A and B, right? Uh, they're just given by the bulks, by the bulk. And so just simply the properties of field theory in the bulk ensure that this will be obeyed because uh, we are treating the bulk as a field theory and this was a general result we derived from field theory. I mean, this inequality. Of course, and this will be non-zero. The right, the right-hand side will be non-zero. Um, okay. So that's uh, okay. Mm. Of course, we also would have this, those other corrections that delta a, etc., that we were discussing before. But all this will be integrals over the surface, right? So for the same reason, so the mutual information coming from these pieces will also vanish uh, for the same reason that the area was vanished. 
So, well, we, we, could, we could still add them, and to have a proper formula, we should also add them. Uh, but uh, if we are interested in finding the qualitatively new effects, we would want to compute it. Con we want to add it. So, in particular, if you had a spin a half here, or a spin a half particle entangled with another spin a half outside, you will get the contribution from, from this term, right? So, it will not come from the gravity term, but it will come from this term. Um, Okay, so now let's um, let's discuss the um, let's di discuss the eternal black hole a little more. Um, uh, yeah, the rest is not known. Yeah. How to compute in a simple way. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so this is the, all these computations are using the bulk effective field theory. You you don't need uh, you don't yeah you don't need to do string theory. But if you had a situation again with a low string scale, then you would want to do it using string theory. Uh, Yeah. Um, by string theory here we are meaning perturbative uh, string theory, it's just classical string theory. Yeah. Uh, are these called as well for mm -hmm. <coughs> um, yeah. Covariant entanglement. What's the like covariant? Time. Ah, good. Uh, yeah, so the, the derivation of the original, of just the, even the Ruta Kanagi term for the time dependent piece was not done. So, uh, and so people are thinking about that, and maybe you could do it, I'm not sure. But once you do that, perhaps you would also get in a simple way the other one. Um, yeah. So the derivation of the original one is for situations that have a time reflection symmetry. That's uh, the one we've given. Um, Okay, but I, well, it's probably also true. Um, so now we'll want to discuss the eternal black hole. Um, so this is uh, the eternal ADS black hole has a Penrose diagram of this form. Um, so here, this is the ADS boundary. So the, the geometry of this region can be drawn as, uh, so we have the boundary region and we have a black hole inside, right? Um, so that's the space-time this is a spatial slice, let's say, through here, of the geometry outside this black hole. So this is the left, e this is the right exterior, exterior right. We have some exterior left here, um, and then uh, so this is a second uh, ADS space uh, with a black hole in it, completely separate from the first one. And these two black holes are connected through the horizon. So if you go, you are one meter outside this black hole, one meter from outside this horizon, you are two meters from each other. And then uh, you have the interior. The important property is that the interior is shared between the two black holes. Um, and the question is, uh, the first question is, what is the uh, field theory interpretation of this geometry? Is, or is there a field theory interpretation of this geometry? And to understand that, uh, it's useful to um, take to think about the analytic continuation of this to Euclidean space by taking this spatial slice, which has a time reflection symmetry. And if you have any situation that has a time reflection symmetry, you can continue uh, time to Euclidean time uh, on the bottom here. And uh, let's say we can think of a picture of a kind of um, half Lorentzian, half Euclidean, where the bottom you have half of the Euclidean uh, black hole. Um, which, um, so recall that the Euclidean black hole is a full circle, so the circle is the time direction of length beta. And then the fact that it shrinks uh, in a smooth way is just um, saying that the topology of this, that the radial direction in the circle is just that of a disk, right? And that's what uh, we are drawing here. So this point here, r equal to zero, is the horizon. So this is the horizon. In uh, Euclidean space, that's just the origin. And it's a completely smooth point. And so we can think of, uh, when we cut here, we can think of um, 
this Euclidean evolution as preparing a state. Recall that uh, even in flat space, we think of Euclidean evolution from U minus, Euclidean, minus infinity in Euclidean time to zero as preparing the ground state wave function. So here we can simp similarly, in the bulk, think of this as creating the state here at equal to zero. And also on the boundary, so we can think of this Euclidean evolution on the boundary as creating a state, but the state now is in the product of two separate disconnected field theories. Right? So these field theories are connected through Euclidean time, but are otherwise disconnected once we uh, go to Lorentzian signature. Okay? Um, so then this um, so this picture tells us uh, what state we should be considering. And the state uh, has the name has a name which is called the thermophile double. In was a state that was considered uh, by w in the context of analyzing thermal field theories. So the state size. So this is a state in uh, CFT left times uh, CFT right. So a state in the direct product of the two Hilbert spaces. Um, as I said, it's called thermophile double, and uh, has the form. So you sum over all um, eigenstates of the, let's say, left field theory with a factor phi to the minus beta e over 2. So this is half of the usual Boltzmann factor. And then you take en for the left theory and en for the right theory. So basically, we take a whole basis of states labeled by n. So we take all, all states. And uh, we take the same state on the right and the same state on the left, and we uh, put these uh, Boltzmann factors. Um, the bar means uh, here we get the time reversal and charge parity conjugate state. I mean, it's related to the fact that... Uh, I mean, the, the way we get this state is simply by evolving... Uh, let's say we get the identity here. If we were to cut a very tiny, tiny space, we just... the identity, right? We sum over all states. And then we just evolve using Euclidean time, and we get... Uh, we get this state. We are, this two comes from the fact that we are considering half of the circle, and this proper this state has uh, uh, has the property that um, well, just define exactly the, the the way it's defined here. The norm of the state would be the partition function, um, or expect more precisely, since the norm can be set arbitrarily, the idea is that if you take operators that depend only on the right, um, and you compute the expectation values on this uh, of these uh, operators on this on this particular state, you get uh, thermal expectation values of all right. So trace over h right of uh, raw thermal. So this is the thermal density matrix for the right part, and so on. Right? Um, and for this reason, it was considered in the past. So some Feynman rules and so on are simple if you. Sim slightly simpler if you think in terms of the thermophile double. Um, okay. So the idea then is that uh, this geometry um, really corresponds to this uh, thermophile double state. And this, uh, well, wh why is that the case? It's simply because we got both the geometry and uh, the boundary state by doing this Euclidean continuation and cutting the Euclidean diagram. So um, we got them from the same construction, um, both following the same construction, both in the boundary and the bulk. And therefore, uh, we would think that they, are, they have to be the same. Okay? So that's the argument that they are the same. Um, but this uh, is uh, rather peculiar. Because we have a, a space which is uh, connected through the interior, uh, but we had two states that were completely disconnected in the boundary theory. Um, so now, for this interpretation to be correct, it should be the case that you cannot send the signal from the left CFT to the right CFT, right? So imagine that it was possible to send the signal uh, from the left to the right, um, then the ability of sending a signal will imply that the, the commutator of the operator that sends the signal will one that receives it. It's non-zero. So we'd have a non-zero commutator. Uh, but that uh, wouldn't be possible if, uh, if the states are just purely entangled. Or in other words, you know that we cannot send the signal uh, using entanglement. Right? Um, 
So entanglement means that you have correlations, but not uh, cannot be used to send in signals faster than light. Um, okay, and so in this particular example, we see that uh, we see that we cannot send a signal because if we try to depart from here, we'll get to the singularity and we'll not get to the other side. So indeed, it's consistent. This interpretation is consistent. But not only that, but in any situation where you have these Lorentzian uh, wormholes, so for all Lorentzian wormholes that have ADS uh, regions in far away, uh, you can prove from the null from the null energy condition uh, implies that uh, there are no signals. Now I'm calling this a wormhole because uh, if you so here uh, we have a sphere, which is this sphere that is uh, shrinking as we go in the radial direction. It reaches a minimum size at the horizon, and then it expands again on the other direction. So the spatial geometry, uh, the spatial geometry on this slice, is really a wormhole. So it's something like, uh, so we have some ADS space, and we connect the two sides in this way. Right. So these two regions are asymptotically hyperbolic in this case. Um, Okay, mm. so GR allows us to have wormholes, but uh, we cannot use them to send signals. Um, and the fact that you cannot use them depends on this uh, null energy condition. So it's somewhat non-trivial property that uh, it all works out to, so that you cannot send signals. It's even more interesting if you realize that so null energy condition means that t plus plus. So the classical null energy condition is that t plus plus should be bigger than zero, right? So the plus plus component of a stress tensor should be bigger than zero, or more invariantly, the contraction of t with a two with the same null kilo, null vector. Well, anyway, it's obvious. Um, um, now, quantum mechanically, you can have. So let, let, I'm now going to make a small digression on this null energy conditions. Um, so uh, quantum mechanically, you can have the t plus plus at the given point might be less than zero. Okay. So, and in general, it will be less than zero. So you can easily, very easily construct a state where the expectation value of uh, t++ in that quantum state is less than zero in some, at some point, OK? Um, uh, now, if you were in flat space, uh, now if you integrate over dx plus, so, um, well, let's say you integrate over dx plus, t++, plus plus, um, then uh, this now is uh, bigger or equal than zero. It's not terribly obvious, but you can make some arguments uh, that, in general, this could, should be bigger than zero. In free field theory, you can check that this is bigger than zero. Um, so if you integrate between minus infinity and infinity of uh, dx plus t plus plus, then that's bigger than zero. If you also integrate over the transverse dimensions, uh, this is just uh, also p plus, uh, which should also be bigger than zero. Okay. Um, Okay, so um, now what? So b because in the quantum theory sometimes uh, t can be less than zero, you will see in the popular literature that uh, quantum mechanics allows wormholes, and you can travel faster than light, and maybe, and and so on. So we can go from the from GR allowed wormholes to science fiction wormholes, right? Okay, uh, but the null energy condition. Uh, um, and, and they say, well, you know, classically it is true that they are not allowed, but, you know, we could have a quantum, according to quantum mechanics, it's allowed. Um, however, uh, people have extended these uh, theorems where the only thing you use is the so-called acronal, acronal average uh, null energy condition. Sorry for being a little technical, but since this is a point that uh, always um, there are uh, many people who claim to have a wormholes that allow travel, uh, traveling faster than light, I like to explain where the negative statement comes from. Um, now, the average null energy condition is that you integrate along the, imagine you have this null, this, uh, you take a null line here, and so you integrate t plus plus along the null line. Okay, so that's what. 
uh, average null energy condition. Now you might think that based on this flat space example, you might think that this is always positive, but it's actually not always positive. And we we can give an example if we consider, for example, a cylinder. The Casimir energy on a cylinder is negative, and we computed the other day the, that t plus plus is minus c over 24, right? So if you integrate it along a uh, null line around the cylinder, so you will get something negative. Okay? So it's not it's actually not true. But a chronal means that uh, you cannot send a, a signal from a time-like signal. There are two points along the null line we're considering are not time-like separated, as they are here. So here you can find two points which are time-like separated. right? Uh, so this is not an achronal line. And uh, for achronal, uh, this null energy condition seems to be true in quantum field theories. And no one has found the counterexample to to this, and uh, it is. Uh, and you can find sort of proofs from, for example, in theories that have holographic duals. Uh, this is true, um, and um, so this is this is believed to be true. So this whole condition, and if you assume this condition, then uh, you don't have traversable wormholes. Okay, so you don't have science fiction wormholes. Is there any question? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that uh, that depends on how we realize. So the operators we um, so here when we talked about entanglement and so on, it, it refers to quantities we can do in the field theory, right? So to field theory quantities and. So, uh, well, that's a, that's a good question. And so some, um, I would say it has to from this uh, picture, but uh, there's, a, there's some discussion. So some people say that it doesn't. So some people would like to claim that uh, this picture is totally wrong. And here you should have some fastballs here and some fastballs here, and you should have no interior. Um, so I'm... Uh, so when I said that that particular thermal field double corresponds to this particular geometry, uh, that was based on this argument. There isn't nothing more than this argument. Um, and so you would have to explain why this argument is incorrect. Um, so people who want to advocate for no interior and firewalls and so on would say, well, perhaps uh, in this argument you, I don't know, you create by tunneling lots of fastballs. Well, there's nothing clear that's been said. Let's say. I, I don't believe those arguments. I don't believe any argument saying that this is wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, some other people want to have it both ways, say that, well, uh, well, I, I'll discuss. A little, well, maybe I should discuss it now. So some people say, OK, so here in this particular case of uh, that thermofield double state, you have some kind of connection. But as soon as you consider more generic states, you will not have uh, any sort of connection. right? And you would have uh, you would have a firewall behind the horizon, just behind the horizon. So those people, um, I guess Joe will advocate that uh, that picture to you later in the week. Um, so the picture uh, there is that the dual of the generic entangled state. So now the idea is that depending on uh, you can have so so here the density matrix for the right. Observe the right uh, side is e to the minus uh, beta h, right? And the same for the left side. The same e to the minus beta h right and h left, okay? Now, just only giving these density matrices doesn't tell you that the dual is this geometry, right? The dual is this geometry only if you have the, that particular entangled state. You could change the entangled state um, keeping uh, the, the density matrix the same, right? So you could, um, for example, act with a unitary operation on the right, right? So if you act with a unitary operator on the right, you would change uh, the entangled state, but uh, you would not change the density matrices, right? Um, so, um, yeah, what I want to say, yeah. So what these people want to say is that uh, if you take took a generic entangled state, then the picture would be 
so the same exteriors by some, some kind of firewall here. So something that when you cross it, you, you die exactly at the horizon and not, not a little later, right? So the whole discussion of the firewall is really about the afterlife. So if someone sees you dying here, would you really die here or experience a little bit of an afterlife later? Right? Um, so that's uh, what the whole discussion is. And um, so, but I, I, I don't feel, what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's a distance. Well, um, it is true. So if the black hole is very large, it's not uh, very big. Um, it could be very big, so it could be a whole more than your lifetime. Um, um, and of course, understanding this is important. Well, I guess Joe will explain why it's important to understand this. Because if you really understood the interior, the interior of a black hole looks like a cosmology, like a collapsing cosmology, uh, an isotropic collapsing cosmology. Uh, so if you really understood the interior of the black hole properly, you perhaps uh, will understand time-dependent backgrounds better, and you'll understand um, how to think about the interior. So I was asked before whether um, what the operators in the interior, what was the description of the operators in the interior. And so in this particular case, we can uh, give a description by saying we have uh, the operator here, and we just evolve it using the bulk equations of motion to this slice. And with this slice, we use uh, some dictionary to express it in terms of, so we, use, we solve somehow the equations of motion sideways to relate it to uh, the operators here on the boundary, on the two sides. So an operator in the interior would be some uh, operator acting both here and here. Um, and that's uh, the description for, the, uh, for these operators in this particular case. Um, um, that's the best description we know. Um, for those operators. Uh, yes. Yeah, I mean, th this operator could suddenly receive a signal from somewhere here and here, or this operator here could send signals here. But this is not surprising because uh, we are acting on both sides, right? Um, OK. Um, now, uh, just one more remark about uh, Wormholes. Um, I was told I could go on forever, right? <laughs> um, what? Ah, okay, good. Um, yeah, a little more about uh, the. The, 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 these wormholes in the case of the of Schwarzschild, right? Of course, the Schwarzschild, eternal Schwarzschild, is uh, the same diagram, and it's really the simplest solution that is spherically symmetric of GR, right? The simplest non-trivial solution. So we like to understand it, and the idea is again that it's an entangled state of uh, black holes in two separate universes. Um, but uh, you can there's a closely related state which would consist of uh, two black holes in the same universe. Um, where, you know, you had uh, the original. So here, if you look at this slice, this slice, uh, as uh, we discussed before, uh, would connect uh, two flat spaces, in this case, through this neck. This is sometimes called the Einstein-Rosen bridge. Einstein and Rosen in 1935 or 6, they noted that uh, there were some, they chose the rod schwarzschild metric in some coordinates where they could see that this slice went uh, from one universe to the other. Uh, their object, well, <coughs> they, they were not thinking about entanglement. Well, they were actually thinking about entanglement because later they wrote uh, Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, but they didn't say that this had anything to do with entanglement. Um, they, they really were motivated by trying to find a uh, geometric picture for particles that would be non-singular. So kind of classical physics idea. Um, Anyway, so you have this, uh, and these are two black holes in completely separate universes. But here you could consider two black holes in the same universe, and as long as they are really far away, uh, they're going to be more or less the same as this. At least the metric in the neighborhood of each horizon is going to be described by this region of the diagram. Um, and you can actually even find the solutions that do this, so it's no problem. Uh, they do exist as solutions. 
So here we have a, so we have a, two observers, one here and one here. Uh, there is a long distance between them, long, and then there is a short uh, distance through the wormhole, right? A spatial distance through the wormhole. So here, the short spatial distance would correspond, so we have these two guys, and they are separated uh, by short distance. Now, as long as these guys stay outside, they cannot send a signal through the wormhole, for reasons we have discussed before. But one thing they can do is they can uh, jump, in, jump inside, so if this person jumps inside, then he can receive the signal of the, from this one, or they can even meet in the interior, right? Um, so, so if uh, you have, let's say this black hole could be in, uh, so we have Romeo and Juliet, right? Which their families didn't want them to meet, so they put them really far away. Uh, but they make themselves, they, they send each other a bunch of qubits and they construct uh, two perfectly entangled black holes. Um, and then after they do all that, then they can meet. Okay? They can jump in and they meet. And, it, and their families didn't, didn't know. They, they, <laughs> they just see them shut me to the black hole. <laughs> they would see them dying. It's, it's ex exactly what Shakespeare wrote, they died. But maybe they actually met them. <laughs> Now, why is this uh, geometric connection somehow relevant for some of the... Well, now I'll discuss something perhaps related to the firewall paradox, and given that Joe will talk about that, that's a little like causal. Um, but, uh, well, this remarks... Well, maybe I skip that. Well, yeah, maybe I'll say. <laughs> okay, so what is the firewall paradox? So let me... Uh, the, w one version of it. So there are sort of four versions. Joe likes to say that there are... It's all the same argument, but I like to say that there are four arguments. So the, there is the paradox number one has to do with entanglement uh, and uses the, subadditivity, the strong subadditivity condition. And this paradox is the following. Suppose that you have a black hole, right? Um, that, um, so it has a certain number of microstates given by the entropy, right? Imagine that this black hole is entangled with some other system. So this is some other reference system, reference system. So let's say it's maximally entangled with the reference system. One way you, might, you, you could consider this happening is by having, you start out with a very big black hole and you let it evaporate it until it becomes uh, this very much smaller black hole. And the initial black hole was so big that it emitted, uh, was initially in a pure state, and it emitted radiation, which it looks like it's completely random. And so at the end of uh, more than half, half the evaporation time, or more, more precisely, after more than half of the entropy was emitted of the original black hole, you will have that that final black hole should be maximally entangled with the out early outgoing radiation. So in that example, this reference system was the early outgoing radiation, but we are not going to necessarily assume that. Um, okay, so this could be the early radiation. So early radiation. So maximally entangled means that if you look at the, at the Hawking mode, one mode that will be emitted later, uh, let's call this uh, mode C, okay? Uh, this will be uh, sort of maximally entangled with some qubit. So th think of this as a qubit degree of freedom. This would be maximally entangled with some qubit degree of freedom in the radiation. So radiation is going to be, a, it's not going to be easy to extract this uh, single qubit that is ent maximally entangled with this qubit outside in Hawking radiation. Um, it's going to be very difficult to do that. Um, but in principle, you could take the early radiation and make it go through a quantum computer that can do such things and extract the qubit B that is maximally entangled with C. Okay? So this line.